It's been an extraordinary few months for the royal family. Let's take a look at some of the highlights from the fascinating to the downright jaw-dropping. And this week, they all involve the Sussexes. Hello, I'm Jo Elvin, and this is a very special episode of your favourite royal show, Palace Confidential. Over the next two weeks, we'll be looking back at the biggest stories and talking points of 2023 so far. And a reminder, before we get going, that if you want more great royal stories all year round, please do remember to like and subscribe below and never miss another episode of Palace Confidential. Well, the year started with a huge and unwelcome event for the royal family, the publication of Prince Harry's memoirs, of course, Spare. The Daily Mail's royal editor, Rebecca English, and the paper's diary editor, Richard Eden, were shocked by the book's explosive revelations. All those stories that myself and other people who work on the Royal Beat have written over the years about the estrangement between the brothers and the issues that were going on behind the scenes that were roundly denied yes. or the palace refused to comment on the time uh, have pretty much all proved to have been true because Harry has confirmed himself, himself in the book. Um, and I mean, I wrote a piece a couple of years ago saying, you know, there's a lot of focus on Kate and Meghan and the kind of war between the two women, but that's actually pretty misogynistic and yeah. very sexist and actually ignores the real story, which is the the falling out between the brothers. And again, I got a lot of grief for it at the time, but, you know, Harry himself admits that he hasn't spoken to his brother or his father or his stepmother, really any family member apart from possibly his cousin, Princess Eugenie, for a long while. And as Richard said, on the basis of this book, I don't see that changing. What he seems to lack is kind people who care for him now, around him. And this is what I find disturbing about his marriage to Meghan, I'm sorry, but someone who genuinely cared for him would say to a lot of these things that Harry, honestly, don't include that. You make yourself look silly or this is not good. But, you know, when I'm listening to audio last night of him talking about, um, oh, don't, you know, don't. talking about using his mother's <laughs> favourite cream say. on his penis. You know, please. It, it, this you say is, that on Palace no, Confidential. There's the YouTube segment. No, <laughs> no, it sorted. No one, yeah. want, no one wants to hear this. And anyone who cared for him would say, look, Harry, just don't include it. But instead, he's got people who want, they want money, money, money. You know, ghostwriter, publisher. They're boasting about how many copies this has sold. Great. You know, Prince William could turn around tomorrow and write a book, I'm sure, that's even more extraordinary and make lots of money. But, you know, we've, he's got dignity. Mm. He's not going to do that. A month later, the fallout from the book was still huge. And after much media speculation over the identity of the older woman who took Prince Harry's virginity, Sasha Walpole stepped forward to tell her story. The Mail on Sunday's Kate Manzi explains. She rightly said in the interview, um, I've kept this secret for 21 years. He sort of outed her. He didn't name her in the book, um, but everybody who knew them at that time knew that it must be her. And I think she just thought, well, all my friends know. She had, the, you know, her phone started pinging and they were saying, you know, have you seen the Daily Mail? She said, no, why? Prince Harry's book, oh my goodness, you're in it. That's you, isn't it? That was oh, the God. episode. And so she's frantically, you know, getting hold of this book and reading the episode and goodness, she's not named, but everybody around her knew that it was her. So I think it was only a matter of time she thought, well, I'm going to have my say. And I don't know if she's upset with him for mentioning it. She just said, you know, he could have phoned me and told, you know, told me, or he could have let me know, or, hey, just not include it at all. So it's strange how he did include it, and I don't know the purpose of it, really. He had that interview with Tom Bradby, if you remember, and he seemed a bit grumpy when Bradby inter you know, interviewed him and asked him about that point in the book. And yes. he said, well, why don't we talk about you losing your virginity, Tom Bradby? And Tom's sort of going, well... Well, yeah. I didn't write mine in the book. <laughs> Quite. Yeah. yeah. So um, you do wonder what kind of pressures were brought to bear by the publishers on that one, because I'm wondering if he perhaps now regrets including it. Well, I don't know. Richard, you suspect, don't you, that he won't really see himself in the wrong here, will he, Harry? No, I mean, the reason Harry included this um, brief episode in his book was for dramatic... Brief. How rude. <laughs> How rude. I think <laughs> Sasha, says, Sasha says five minutes. I think 15 minutes away from the pub. It was, it was Five brief. minutes for the actual... Uh, no, the, re the reason he included it was it did actually play an important dramatic purpose. Now, what that was was that he had a visit from his um, long-term mentor, Mark Dyer, known as Marco in the book, who came to Eton to visit him and to quiz him about something. 
And he felt very nervous because he thought that Marco had come to quiz him about um, this episode with Sasha Walpole that he thought might have been seen by others. <coughs> right. Well, anyway, it turned out that Marco had come to grill him about drugs because people had um, they'd had reports from journalists that he'd been seen, um, I think it was smoking cannabis or taking other drugs. And he wanted to ask him about this. And to Harry's great shame, and he admits it was one of the few things actually in his book he admits he was ashamed of, he lied to someone he trusted most of all, Marco, and he told him that it was untrue mm. about the drug. So he, he just mentioned the um, virginity in that context in the book. So it's quite brief. You know, but he's put it all out there. This great privacy campaigner has, you know, just abolished his own privacy. And a few weeks later came the news that the Sussexes had been turfed out of their Windsor home, Frogmore Cottage. Rebecca English and Richard Eden pick up the story. Well, I'm not sure it was th that sudden. Okay. I mean, they've, they've been given plenty of notice, so they've got to move out, well, move their things out. I think it's by, um, by June, so after the coronation. And apparently they were told in January. It just happened to coincide with um, the publication of Prince Harry's memoir, Spare. Um, so I think we can probably um, assume that the two <laughs> things might be connected. But I just, I mean, this, this reaction I'm hearing from sort of, you know, Harry and Meghan's cheerleaders, oh, they're so shocked, they're so surprised. What on earth did he expect? You know, I mean, my goodness, you know, if I started writing a book about how dreadful my family were, you know, and then doing a TV programme stretched over weeks for, you know, being insulting them day after day, you know, I would expect some sort of reaction. You would be evicted from one of your family's houses. Yeah, they might cut <laughs> yeah. off my pocket money or whatever. Um, you know, and the, f the fact is, you know, they had this, um, you know, lovely property, and it's a special arrangement. You know, it's a really, you know, it's an honour to have it. And, you know, they weren't using it, obviously, for um, the vast majority of the year anyway. And, you know, why should they be allowed to? You know, they've left the royal family. They made a big song and dance about it. You know, now they can use some of their millions to spend it, um, you know, on staying at a hotel next time they're over. Well, Rebecca, I was going to ask, do you think they'll be furiously searching for Airbnbs? nearby for the coronation. What, what does it all mean? Well, this, I mean, it has really put the cat amongst the pigeons. Um, and I think it obviously indicates that their coronation uh, potential appearance is more in doubt. I mean, the royal family aren't exactly laying out the welcome mat for them. I mean, I've been told this decision is kind of, is twofold. It, one, it comes down to money. You know, Charles is trying to balance the books better. And uh, they have a pot of money from the Duchy of Lancaster, which the um, the monarch can do with uh, as they please. And he, the Queen, has always ring fenced a big chunk of that to um, protect Andrew, especially after he wasn't a working royal. <sighs> and Charles is having to work out how to do that. Should he be seen rattling around Royal Lodge? You know, mm. would it be better for him to move into Frogmore? There's all sorts of things that are coming into play. But also, I think they're just fed up of this, and they just want everything sorted you know, either before the coronation or pretty soon after, so he can just move forward with the rest of his reign without con this constant family drama. And, and does it mean, though, that for Harry and Meghan there's no house, there's no seat really on offer? No, there's from, nothing. There no, is nothing, absolutely, yeah. that's why I've been guided, there is, yeah. they're not being offered any other property. It's like, it really is as brutal as clear stuff out and get out. Um, I mean, well, one thing I should say that's astonishing is that, remember, Prince Harry is still a councillor of state, legally. You know, he could be asked, I mean, obviously he won't be in a hurry, but potentially he could be asked legally to stand in for the monarch. He now has no home at all in Britain. I mean, that's ridiculous, isn't it? I mean, have a new Act of Parliament strip him off that. Otherwise, you know, it, it's absurd, I think. Have you got a spare room in case he needs it? Look, if they need to visit for the coronation, you know, we've got a spare room. We can, we can make, make room for them. We'll, we'll, we'll try to, um, you know... To be fair, the King's got quite a lot welcome. of spare rooms as well. well the quite. many royal properties. Yes. It's not like they can't stay anywhere. And, of course, when they go to visit places like New York to do interviews and stuff, they stay in a hotel there. So, I, But I do think there is, you know, a psychological difference with losing 
a home in the country mm. of your birth. Mm. I mean, things have changed a lot because they did intend, from what I hear, to genuinely come back to visit regularly. But obviously, because of their own actions, their relationship with the family uh, has turned to dust. Um, we, should, we should say that there's some very serious, like unintended consequences of this decision, though. I mean, for example, say they decide to come over for um, carry out some engagements, that sort of thing. They might do what other um, wealthy, important people do and stay at a hotel. You know, so you get the security. Maybe they're staying at, say, Mandarin Oriental in Knightsbridge, and it will become a circus. You know, we will be able to see the press will be outside. There'll be and photographs be of for that famous people. They'll have to pay right. for that themselves, um, and. You know, previously, when they've been at Windsor, it's been very private. We didn't hear, you know, nothing really when they stayed at the Platinum Jubilee celebrations or at the time of the, the Queen's death. So, you know, that does really, it could cause a problem in the future. It's a good point. They were only seen when they wanted to be seen. Yeah. Now they are going to be like any other jobbing celebrity coming into the UK. And then there was the row over the titles. Harry and Meghan decided to give to their children, Archie and Lilibet. It was suddenly <coughs> announced in People magazine, which is obviously one of the Sussex's American publications of uh, favour, that there had been a christening, Princess Lilibet Diana's christening on Friday at the couple's home in California. Um, that in itself would, would be a story, of course it would be, but of course the first thing my eye was drawn to was the mention of Princess Lilibet Diana because that's not something uh, we'd ever seen, been seen used before and obviously it sparked a whole gamut of questions from me and other royal correspondents into Buckingham Palace as to what on earth was going on. Now when you were reading that because I, I, I've seen that you've tweeted this morning that they've changed their titles on that line mm. of succession on the official. What, had that been done prior to this coming out? So without becoming a bit of a history bore, <laughs> they, uh, they they, Lilibet and, and Archie were, have always been prince and princess since their grandfather acceded to the throne. They weren't when they were the great-grandchildren of the monarch, but now they are the grandchildren through the male line of the monarch. They're entitled to be prince and princess. But what was really interesting is, is one of the questions people such as myself asked of Buckingham Palace in the days after Queen Elizabeth died, are you going to be updating it? What's going to be happening? And what I think was really interesting is we were constantly being batted off. And, you know, well, the king has got a very big in train. He's got lots of things to deal with. And, you know, it's there, it, you know, which, again, made us all quite suspicious at the time that something more was going on behind the scenes. Why wouldn't they just update it? Because they did update the rest of the website to reflect the changed order of succession. Um, and from what I understand, that really smarted with Harry and Meghan. They were like, well, why aren't they doing it? And they were a bit panicky behind the scenes that the king could bring in letters patent to change um, the uh, existing rules to uh, make it not automatic they became a prince and princess. And for Harry, this was all tied up with issues of security. So there has been a bit of you know, toing and froing going on behind the scenes about it. And I, I personally think the Sussexes have forced the palace's hand on this. Yeah. That's what I was wondering. And I, I think, uh, here's where I'm confused, Richard. Maybe you can help me out. I, th I seem to recall them saying that they, they didn't want those titles. It, 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 they seem to flip-flop from wanting the titles to very, very, very desperately wanting the titles for their children. Oh, let's be clear here. I mean, after the birth of Archie, when it was announced his name was Archie Harrison Mountbatten Windsor, um, you know, there all their sort of cheerleaders um, briefed that they didn't want titles. They didn't want fancy titles. They weren't that kind of royal. And then when we had the Oprah Winfrey interview, um, Meghan talked about the pain of having titles and how, you know, it can be really difficult. And, and she actually said she wouldn't, um, although it's the birthright of the children, she wouldn't wish this on them until they were older. Well, now, um, she hasn't waited till they're adults. No, no, they're using it already. It's mm. Princess Lilibet. So, you know, it really is um, significant and, and interesting. And I think it's interesting as well in that it wasn't, it was only a few weeks ago when Harry was telling, I think, Tom Bradby that, the institution needed updating and it was very antiquated and what do you am well, I wrong? It, well exactly I mean there are a people a lot of people who think this does really smack of hypocrisy that they spent the last two years doing nothing but out, uh, attacking the institution of the monarchy and members of the royal family and yet 
seize upon uh, the idea of um, of having titles for their children because let's not forget um, the Earl and Countess of Wessex for example when their children Louise and James were born they were automatically entitled to be prince and princess and they actively chose not to because they wanted their children to kind of grow up unfettered by this straitjacket of royal life and make decisions when they were old enough to make those decisions and I think you know Lady Louise I think she's now 19 and she's still not chosen to use an HRH or a princess so I think that gives us a good indication of how they're going to live their future lives um, so that option was available to Harry and Meghan if they show cho so chose it, and they have chosen not to, which I do think is very interesting. I mean, let, let's be clear, you know, what's happened here is that normally with a change like this, a big change, it would be announced by the palace. Um, you know, Lady Louise Windsor wouldn't dream of suddenly start styling herself Princess Louise without an announcement from the palace, and then it would be in the Gazette in the traditional way. No, no, here it's just been released in, um, in a statement of People magazine. I mean, you know, it's clear that it's Harry and Meghan that have been pushing the issue here. And there are reports, Rebecca, that the rest of the family were invited to the christening but declined to attend? Yeah, I mean, the palace said they wouldn't comment on private correspondence <laughs> when I asked them about this yesterday. But, you know, to be fair, I'm, I'm sure if the christening had been in this country, even despite the tension between them, the king and the queen consort would have attended. But you just can't have our head of state suddenly upping sticks and flying off to a private home in in California because a because of security b because he is our head of state and he has matters to deal with here so I I think it's really unfair to kind of use that as a stick to beat him with that that clearly he's not interested enough in his grandchildren to go I mean he just can't do that sort of thing but um, we did we did get the name of a godparent this time Richard <laughs> we did and we already knew the man who'd been asked to be um, godfather and that was the American entertainment mogul um, Tyler Perry now viewers of Harry and Meghan's Netflix series might remember Harry um, telling, talking into his phone while he was on a plane to California saying that he'd never spoken to Tyler Perry, he didn't know him, but they'd um, agreed to stay at his house and everything. And so in return, um, he's asked um, him to be, you know, bringing um, Princess Lilibet into the um, Christian faith and overseeing her life. So it's quite an interesting thing. But I mean, let's talk about how extraordinary this christening is. I mean, remember, Prince Harry's father is the supreme governor of the Church of England. You know, and Archie was christened at Windsor by the Archbishop of Canterbury. But what we've had here is this, um, you know, backyard um, in the garden ceremony um, with the um, Bishop of LA, not an archbishop this time, but the Bishop of LA um, coming in to do the christening in their gardening. Look, I don't know how it works in America, but I mean, can you just, you know, call a bishop like we would call a, a takeaway dinner or something? I think you can if you're Harry HRH. Uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, here baptisms take place as part of a, a church service usually, and it's for, you know, very much welcoming a new member of, of the church. Um, so it seems something, um, I mean, Tyler Perry actually specifically said that he didn't want to go if it was in um, Britain with the royal family, but he would do it if it was, um, you know, in L.A. So it, it sounds to me like they've kind of organised it for the benefit of this, this mogul. Well, as long as Tyler's happy, I'm happy. I mean, the clearest thing from me for the whole um, business of the titles and everything is that it, it does strike me as, as revenge by Harry and Meghan. It really does. I mean, what we've seen is two big developments over the past week. Last week it emerged that they're being evicted from their, their only um, British home, you know, which they described as their forever home at Frogmore Cottage. And then we also learnt that Camilla's grandchildren were going to have roles at the coronation. You know, and both things I think will have, you know, upset Harry and Meghan. They think, what can we do um, to, you know, have our revenge? And that's making sure that our children have these these new titles. I mean, they can be at the coronation with their prince and princess, you know, while other grandchildren of a monarch like Zara Tyndall or Lady Louise, you know, are there just as um, <laughs> relatively low down the scale. So it's it's really telling. Do you, do you agree with Richard? Well, I, th I tell you what's really fascinating me is overnight they put out another statement um, to their kind of chosen media, kind of making the point, and obviously I think they've been stung by some of the debate that they've seen over this, is 
that they made a point of saying this is our children's birthright. It, 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 it's quite an inflammatory choice of words and one I think was totally unnecessary. We've all said in today's newspapers it is their birthright, we know it is, but there just seems an attempt to kind of ram it down people's throats. We're not being unreasonable, this is ours for the taking. Mm. And Buckingham Palace haven't given it to us yet and we don't understand why, which again it, it feeds into my feeling that they have forced the palace's hand on this. And wouldn't you believe it, there was a twist in the tale of Frogmore Cottage. Kate Manzi explains. Frogmore Cottage was the, the, the property that the Queen allowed Harry and Meghan to use as their official residence after they were married. They moved out of Kensington Palace, a bit of a distance between them and Kate and William, and set up home in Frogmore Cottage. They had to do quite a lot of work to that cottage, 2.4 million it turns out, to renovate it. And they smushed lots of different properties into one big one um, and made it nice for them, nice family home. Uh, that was public money. Mm. So when they left the royal family, Buckingham Palace put out a statement pretty soon, pretty early days, saying it was their wish, Harry and Meghan's wish, that they would pay that money back so they could be held to account. Indeed, they did pay the money back. And my story at the weekend showed that they paid that 2.4 million lump sum. But what we had all, I think, expected was that they would then pay a commercial rate. We'd expected that because initially that's what the palace had said. Now it transpires that, in fact, they didn't have to pay any more monthly payments after that because the money they spent reimbursing the taxpayer on the property raised the value of the property to such an extent that it counted as basically rent in lieu. So this was the fact that, OK, you've paid that 2.4 million, we'll call it quits. You've raised the value of the property, you've done all this work, you've paid for it because you've reimbursed the taxpayer. Um, so we don't, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll leave that there. And it was quite interesting because it's touching a push, pu kind of push pressure points with the um, the palace on anything to do with the Sussexes is really, really difficult. Well, but I think ultimately it's public money and how yeah. a deal was struck to repay that public money. And some people might think, well, 2.4 million, fair enough. They've paid that money back and that's a lot of money and they've barely lived there. So why should they pay any more rent? Well, also, this must have made it particularly annoying for Harry and Meghan that, that they've been told they have to leave, because <clears throat> if they were essentially staying there rent-free now, having paid off that money, you know, it was a, a nice little number for them, wasn't it? So um, I'm sure that will add to their annoyance. Well, it wasn't just Harry writing books with bombshell royal revelations. Robert Jobson released a biography of Charles called Our King. Our experts analyse some of the biggest talking points. And it's always fascinating, Richard Kay, to hear words quoted from the Queen's mouth. Yes. And, it, and, you know, and the book reveals that apparently the Queen thought the Sussex's behaviour was quite mad and found Harry's phone calls wearisome. That's absolutely right. I mean, I, I, I recall at the time of the whole Mexit saga, uh, the Queen's heart would sink when she learned from her page that a call was coming through from California and she would have to listen to Harry and, and possibly a litany of complaints. But usually there were, there were issues that she would much rather he would have talked to his father about, to Charles. Instead, she found herself sort of piggy in the middle between them. Mm. Yeah, it's um, amazing to think that you can phone the Queen and have that conversation. Well, she, you know, she was his grandma. I know, yeah. but it's, she's also the Queen, as he pointed out to Meghan on many occasions. I think it became increasingly difficult, as we learned from his books, for him to contact the Queen. Yes. She but, started making excuses. But before anybody cries bias, apparently Richard Eden, the Queen, also had sharp words for William on occasion as something to, over the use of a helicopter. Oh, this is interesting, yeah. This is something which, um, you know, some people might not know, but generally, the tradition is that the heirs don't travel together because of <clears throat> the dangers of, you know, losing more than one heir to the throne. And I think Queen Elizabeth was um, very concerned that there'd been a couple of occasions. I think um, William was flying to Norfolk with, with his whole family, so with his son Prince George, and she felt they should be travelling separately. Mm. Um, and that's something that does come up, but um, they are meant to travel separately because, uh, you know, remember Prince Harry is still very high up in the line of succession. So unless we want Harry and Meghan on the throne, we do need to be careful. Well, it's interesting you raise that because the thing that I found interesting was um, the reports of the, the Queen sort of like sanctioning Harry to go to war but not William. And I'm wondering how Harry will interpret that in considering he's, you know, in the <sighs> book he talks about how 
I'm only here in case William needed a kidney sort of a vibe. Is How it? do you think he will interpret um, those comments? Well, just say so this was um, a separate story, absolutely fascinating from yeah. a new ITV documentary. Yeah. And it was the former head of the army, General Sir Mike Jackson. And he, a bit naughty, but he was revealing his private conversation with the Queen. And um, the Queen said to him that, um, yeah, she didn't want William. Um, um, to serve, I think, but but Harry, it was okay, or that was the decision. No, in fact, what he actually, what she actually said was, my sons or my grandsons are taking the Queen's shilling, therefore they must serve. Um, but then it it subsequently uh, emerged that William would not go to Afghanistan or Iraq, where it was all right for Harry to go out. That's the mm. bit that fascinated yeah. me. Yeah. So that wasn't the Queen's decision, to be clear. That was a sort of general decision that had been taken by the army and the powers I that mean, be. I mean, you've got to go back 40 years, and she went through a much more uh, close to her decision, if you like, over the deployment of Prince Andrew uh, in the Falklands conflict as a helicopter pilot. I mean, he, he, he played a, a, a very crucial role in what he had to do as he flew decoy missions mm. to, 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 so that Argentine missiles wouldn't sink our, um, our shipping. Um, and, you know, she was extremely worried about him doing that, but the, but the fact was he had signed up yeah. uh, as, a, as a full-time naval officer and he and, had to go. And was, again, not the heir to the throne. And was not the heir to the throne. No. It's montage time, and over the next couple of weeks we'll be looking back at some of our favourite pictures of 2023. Here's part one. I hope you enjoyed that. And a reminder to hit that subscribe button if you haven't already and never miss another episode. We'll be back with part two next week. See you then. Bye-bye.